uh, we're going to be talking about the evolving role of a GC and TRAM in the digital transformation era. How do we really leverage technology? Because we, you know, one of our keynote speakers also said that that is the holy grail, you know, that is something that's an intrinsic part. So how do we really leverage that in legal processes and paperless journey of organizations and more? You know, before I highlight uh, the topics that we are going to be cover uh, covering, I think it would be the best idea to actually invite our experts on board who are, of course, very diligently waiting backstage. So allow me to first up invite, of course, our moderator. So we would once again request you Mr. L. Badri Narayanan, the executive partner, Lakshmi Kumaran and Sridharan attorneys to please uh, grace the stage with his presence because you're going to be holding the contours of the discussion again. So uh, we'd be happy to, of course, uh, see you right there back on the screen. Of course, gradually our panelists also joining in. So allow me to welcome and warmly welcome Pooja Sehgal Mehtani to start with, uh, who is the General Counsel Asia Service Centers and CSASCI. Sun Life India Service Center. Well, to talk about uh, you, Pooja, you head the legal and corporate secretarial affairs of the organization and you lead the knowledge services legal vertical also within the organization providing legal services to various geographies on technology contracts. And yes, you're the key contributor to organization strategy and the corporate decision-making team. Warm well, welcome to you. With that, allow us to welcome Smita Chandra Shekhar Raya, the Director, Legal Herman International India. Well, Smita, uh, experienced legal professional general counsel with a history of working across industries, but not limited to logistics, IT, healthcare, asset finance, audiovisuals in the Asia Pacific region and her core strengths in the areas of privacy, of course, uh, employment, privacy, employment, general corporate, commercial contract litigations to just name a few. Happy to be hosting you. With that, allow us to welcome Shujat bin Ali, the General Counsel and the Chief Compliance Officer from Ramki Enviro Engineers. Warm welcome. Uh, well, 20 years of experience, a corporate legal experience in leading MNCs of um, say sectors such as pharmaceuticals, manufacturing, software, IT, enabled services, professional services for you, Shujat, and um, you have overseen governance, regulatory, corporate secretarial, legal ethics, compliance functions. Again, um, of course, uh, you provide your legal oversight and operational legal support for businesses. So that's great to know. And uh, with that, please allow me to warmly uh, usher in right there on the virtual stage. Let's welcome Hanno Kunkel, the EVP and General Counsel Siemens. Well, uh, to talk about you before joining Siemens, uh, you've been working with Man Diesel and Turbo as uh, the Vice President and Head of Compliance. And you've also worked with the man group, the GE Capital, Baker and McKinsey. Uh, happy to be um, uh, hosting you as well. And of course, looking forward to the insights that you're going to be sharing. With that, allow us to also welcome Richika Nair, the General Counsel from Nexus Malls. Well, uh, Richika is a distinguished legal professional, ladies and gentlemen. 25 years of experience for her in handling a range of legal and regulatory issues. And of course, prior to, uh, prior to joining Nexus Malls, she was working with the GMR Group as a vice president and head corporate legal there. And previously, she's also been associated with l and Infrastructure, uh, Finance Co, Apple Finance, uh, KSL and Industries, Nune Insurance and more. And uh, with that, allow me to also convey a warm, gratitude to our session sponsor, Lakshmi Kumaran and Sridharan attorneys. So with that, Mr. Narayanan, if you're all set, we are ready to give the virtual rope of discussion to you. Thank okay. you so much, uh, uh, Shika. And uh, I've got a very exciting panel, I must say. Uh, we had a very interesting discussion a few days ago, so I am very excited to be uh, moderating this. Um, so thank you for that, Shika. Um, Everyone, I think uh, we've got a great panel ahead and, and we're going to be discussing a wide variety of issues and topics in this panel. And I, I want to uh, really talk about this because uh, legal technology trends has been something which we've been talking a lot about. Um, over the last few years, a lot more discussion relating to 
what is the meaning of legal tech and how is that going to have an impact on the legal profession um you got some experience people and and without getting into too much of details i thought i'm going to dive straight in into this uh, session um and i'm going to go to hano uh, to start with hano welcome to the session um and uh, just as an opening i would just like to you to tell me uh, your experience with legal tech and uh, what do you think uh, you learned from you know spending the last 4 5 years um looking at tech and how it can transform and reform uh, your organization so over to you hano why don't you give us your opening thank you very much barry uh, yeah um good afternoon everybody and uh, thanks for for having me on this panel um yeah when i saw the topic i immediately said oh uh, could i please uh, be part of this panel uh, because that's really a topic very close to my heart and um yeah and before i start talking about the current legal trends how how i see them um and of course it's just my perspective um let me go a couple of years back i mean but as you already mentioned this is not a completely new trend i mean we already dealt with the question um yeah so what does it mean uh, what does ai mean for us lawyers um you know the way how computers solve legal problems with ai um how does this work and what does it mean for us so i'm i'm not sure when it started for me i was uh, six or five years ago i think i was still working uh, with siemens but uh, in germany at headquarters and we started to look at this and we we thought well um yeah we need to look at the potential of all this new technology there were also all this new technology legal tech service providers coming up and trying to sell us some of their services and uh, suddenly all the law firms were under pressure what does it mean for their business models so it was a very interesting time and it still is um and so of course we as siemens legal we also wanted to become more efficient we wanted to pay less to some law firms um, we wanted to yeah basically become more efficient and save some costs and we also were a little bit you know there were also a few concerns um or almost fears i would say one was oh we need to get into this area otherwise we miss out on some on something very important something very important is happening and we need to be you know involved there otherwise we lose out on something and then there was this bigger concern this very fundamental concern what does this general development mean for us lawyers will ai basically in the digital age somehow make us redundant you know i mean during that time many professions start to ask themselves this question also we lawyers did after a couple of years i am totally convinced that this will not be the case in the next decades for various reasons but anyway we started to to look into this and we started with various projects so what we did we do we did what everybody did you know we looked at the areas we try to identify the right um areas of our work where the use of ai and this new tools could help us so for example we looked at the repetitive low complex work right this is what everybody did ndas um yeah looking um due a certain due diligence tasks or just task where we have we are faced or overwhelmed by massive amounts of data then we thought this are maybe the right areas to look at um core work complex work strategical work business critical work we excluded but we looked at all the rest and we started various projects and i would dare to say that most of them failed um and they were all pretty re uh, revolutionary you know because it was they were all the idea was always we replace a lawyer who worked on on repetitive low complex work by something by by ai and so it was we aimed very high i would say and maybe looking back at this that was maybe one of the mistakes so for example what we did was um in our procurement area there are very many questions um from the procurement guys coming to the lawyers which are repetitive and low complex so we thought that's the right area so we developed a tool um and all our poor internal clients they were not they couldn't write us an email or call us anymore they needed to use this tool 
uh, because the idea behind it, then the tool, you know, it was like a communication tool. They um, inserted their questions, they entered their questions, and they got a reply from a lawyer. And it, of course, it was also tracking how fast uh, did they get the reply, how satisfied they were, blah, 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 blah. But the main idea was somebody, some AI algorithm is, is reading all this is reading all the questions coming to the legal department and is reading all the email, uh, all the answers and is analyzing this. So that's what, it was basically a typical AI topic during that time, analyzing large unstructured data, you know, and making something out of that. So the idea was after a while, the, um, the, comp the, the AI algorithm is already suggesting to the lawyer who now needs to answer a new question, this is maybe the right answer. Why don't you answer like this? That was step one. And of course, long ahead, the second step would have been, we are not involved anymore. The AI, like a chatbot, is answering the questions. It's, I mean, it was a repetitive, low complex word, right? But to be honest, didn't work out at all. Not even this first step. It was not a help. Yes, after after having done this for a while, there was uh, the tool suggested us some answers, but they were all not helpful at all. And the reason was not enough data. We could the AI would have needed uh, uh, like I don't know a thousand times more data, more questions and answers in order to come up with some meaningful support, and we never got there. So that was a big failure, to be honest, because it was also not that great for the clients, the internal ones, you know, first they had to use this tool and then they learned, well, sorry, didn't work out. And then we did other things. We worked with with, internal, uh, with external service providers, you know, who worked, um, they were supposed to handle all our NDAs. Um, they had all the tools and they had legal playbooks and they had all the support from us. This is how an NDA should look like. Also didn't work out. We invested lots of resources there and a bit of money. Um, and the reason why this didn't work out, very interesting, I think, was the business partner proximity was completely gone. Yes, an NDA is very simple. Yes, it's always the same. Yes, it's also boring for the lawyers who are involved there, but you need to understand a little bit of the project, which is covered by this NDA. Otherwise, you can have a huge IP risk. I mean, a, a huge IP problem. So, yes, maybe it doesn't need to be a senior lawyer, but this guy needs to understand at least something about our business. So also a huge failure, if I may say so. So, um and today, and there was also a big contradiction, and this is almost funny, I think, because during that time, we were all not digital natives. You know, we were, some of us were still struggling with all the functionalities of Outlook and, and our um, document management system. So, you know, it was non-digital natives who were trying to revolutionize their own work, I think. Yeah. Now, I think after all this time, we have been more realistic and we are working just on small things. You know, knowledge management, huge development in the last few years. We have new tools which make it so much easier to find the right legal knowledge in the company or um, customer friendliness. We have other tools and we have other, uh, different ways to explain legal complexity in simple terms to our colleagues. This is also a huge change and it, it makes our lives also easier. We have something like a legal Google within Siemens where our business partners can look up certain things before they come to us and stuff like this. It's small, it's small things. Or we have a new contract repository, which is like thanks to Salesforce, but it's like 10 times better than the one we had before. And all these small things, they really save time or a document um, email archiving system, a new one. In the old days, I was always working on my emails and archiving them here and there. This is all gone. This is all automated now. It's so my main point is it's an exciting time. It's great, but it's an evolution and it's not a revolution from my perspective at all. And when it comes to the business proximity and the legal core work, you need a human being, I think, at, the next, in the, at, at least in the next couple of decades. Thank you so much, Hanno. And uh, like I said, it's very reassuring that our jobs are still safe. <laughs> at least for the foreseeable future uh, and so that really uh, legal tech yeah. 
you know, so I can't give you a guarantee. Yeah, I'm quite okay. by. <laughs> we will, we will, we will, for our own benefit, we will, we will make this inference. Uh, but I want to bring in Pooja. And I think Pooja, like uh, Hanno said, uh, very interesting thoughts about, you know, uh, how um, uh, Siemens went about a few years ago, not digital native. COVID has forced all of us to be digital native. So why don't you give your perspective um, uh, and your brushes with uh, with this uh, automation, digitization, all, digitization, all of these. Why don't you give us your perspective? Sure. Thanks, Badri. And uh, thanks, Liga Era, for giving me this opportunity to being on the panel. Uh, panel. Um, you know, I uh, can't agree more with what whatever Hanno said. You know, uh, in, in uh, the crux of it is that you got to start small, but you got to leverage technology. You got to, uh, you know, be on this transformation journey more so, Padri, what we've seen after the pandemic, right? I would not say that, uh, you know, as an organization, we just started up the, after the pandemic. Uh, we were, in fact, uh, you know, uh, uh, fortunate that we started thinking and uh, digitize some of the processes uh, within the department uh, before the pandemic. And that kind of uh, helped us quickly to switch on the work from home mode. Right. So that's another perspective. Now we are into a totally different world. And, uh, you know, for an example, we had digitized our contract management system. Right. That helped us a lot. Uh, when we, uh, you know, quickly could switch on to work from home. We had uh, already within the team felt a need that, you know, the way we monitor our work, the way we have our MIS should be digitized because within the team also coordinating the work gets easier, right? That was another, uh, you know, big advantage that we had when we, uh, you know, to manage work during the pandemic because one of the aspects also is, and we need to keep that in mind is, what we've seen through the pandemic is that we need to scale up quickly, right? You never know what hits you. Uh, and the legal team has to be involved, not only doing their core legal, but have to, as Hanno also said, that business partnering is very uh, essential, you know, and uh, uh, yeah, very critical. And uh, when the pandemic hit, you had to do much more than, you know, uh, what you were doing earlier. You had to support business on different fronts and there was a need to scale up some of the things if you had digitized within your department or you know you at least started thinking about them then you could support business uh, you know more so quickly and manage the different challenges also that were coming your way right uh, uh, for an example i would um, like, uh, uh, you know, managing or the board related uh, work, right? If you weren't, uh, you, you, if you hadn't digitized all of those things, it would have been a problem, right? Uh, there were uh, changes in the law, but at your end also, uh, you know, you, if, if you had handled and digitized all those processes, it was a smooth sale. And uh, yep. there were learnings as well, uh, you know, um, after that as well. And also what uh, Hanno referred to that you cannot just work as a legal department in silos and think of uh, digitizing a process or automating a process and then think that it's going to, you know, be quickly adopted by the other business functions uh, as well. It's going to take a lot of time. Change management, I think, is also very crucial when we take up any such process, improvisation and leveraging technology, because we also have to think that it's not only, not only uh, the legal department that will be taking up that process, but you would definitely need support from the other business functions and the other enabling functions as well. Take, for example, the regulatory compliance assessment. You know, we automated and digitized it, but a lot of change management went into it. Right. Uh, of course, uh, you know, we can't really uh, keep aside uh, the risk that comes uh, along with uh, adopting any technology because we are, you have to keep in mind that your client data, your customer data, your business data is protected. Right? That's just one aspect. But having the teams along with you on that digitization and automation journey is also very, very important. Otherwise, as Hanno said, that as simple a task as an NDA, if you know, the yeah. involvement of the lawyer is not there. You know, people could have simple queries. Sometimes uh, we also see even now nowadays that business functions uh, might struggle to an extent to even come up with what scope has to be included in the contract, right? 
So <laughs> a lawyer has to be essentially there to understand what's the scope, what's there in the contract, and then accordingly have, um, you know, accordingly draft it to avert all the risks. Yeah, right. So, I understand uh, that. Uh, yeah. So no, no system, whether you digitize it, automate it, will uh, work in isolation. Business partnering is very, very essential. But definitely, it's going to give you a lot of uh, efficiency if you pick up the right solution that serves your department's need as well as the business's need as well at the same time. And uh, uh, you know, start slow. You know, don't pick that's up all nice... the problems. Yeah, start slow yeah, and that's... start small. Uh, and uh, you know, we we shouldn't really uh, think that something that's working for another company might work for us. It might be a totally different solution that we require. Right? Excellent and points, Pooja. I think those are like excellent, excellent points. And I think it's a nice segue to go to Ruchika. So very clear. So Hanno had his experiment. It blew up on its face. You've been able to automate and digitize over the last uh, at least year and a half, you know, in a in a sustained manner. And you recommend that you go for tools that are really going to be serving your purpose. Okay. Now let's try and understand how, for example, these tools are actually picked up and what's the criteria that you are. And maybe I'll bring in Ruchika. Ruchika, why don't you give us your thoughts on how, for example, you go about figuring out what tools you require now that you are in this automated, digitized world. Um, and what are the criteria that you apply? Why don't you give us your thoughts? Sure. Am I audible? Sure. Yeah. Thank you. So first of all, thank you very much to the Legal Era team for organizing this webinar and also inviting me to share my thoughts. So Badri, as you said, you know, we all know that adopting technology is very essential in the legal industry. And also with the growing, uh, you know, number of in-house tools and platforms available in the market. So it's a very important decision which the legal department has to make as to what is important for it and how it will, you know, basically help the department uh, in furthering of its requirements. So I think the first and foremost is to identify the specific issues that can be solved through that tool or through that platform. So like, you know, you may be working in a department where you're actually handling only transactional work and you have a very minimal litigations. So in those cases, you know, choosing a litigation management tool may not be very effective. Whereas if you're working, uh, you know, in a department, you're handling uh, retail litigations or, you know, the litigations are in hundreds of thousands of numbers, there probably a litigation management tool will be very effective, uh, you know, for the purposes that it will enhance and uh, to uh, keep the records and get you updates on the litigations. So uh, that is one important point to identify what is the specific issues that needs to be resolved from the tool. I think the second important issue is also that, uh, you know, the tool or the platform should be actually increase the productivity of the department. So it should be very, uh, you know, simple and easy to update and understand. And it should actually save the cost of the legal teams and not add on to the stress with, uh, you know, complicated ways of, you know, working and operating it. That's important. And I think apart from that, uh, you know, what is important is what is the return on investment? So uh, when I say return on investment, I don't mean that, you know, you go for a, you know, cheaper or a less expensive tools. What it means is that basically, even if you're going for a, you know, maybe a, a little expensive tool, how eventually it will help in reducing your dependency on say external agencies or reducing your future costs also, and also your turnaround time and, uh, you know, reverting to the management on issues which you want to, you know, basically uh, want that tool to provide to you. That's important. And I think another important point is that, you know, whatever may be the platforms and uh, tools you adopt today, you have to also look at the future. So basically any uh, tool which you adopt today should be able to interface and integrate with the other systems in the department and also outside of the department so that, you know, uh, you don't have tools in various, uh, you know, company in various uh, departments, which are not able to talk to each other and they're of no use at a later stage. So I think these are the important uh, issues which uh, we uh, yeah, uh, take care while you know, choosing what is the best. And as Pooja said, you know, um, if you are a growing organization, it's not that you, you know, adopt all the tools, you know, it has to be a gradual process where you see and assess and determine and then, you know, decide what is best suited for your team and then go ahead with that. 
Excellent. Yeah. Thank you so much, Ritika. Very great point that you made. Uh, I want to come to Shijat today now. And I don't. I wanted to get your experience with any specific tools um, that you may have looked at, or any specific area that you think uh, you feel legal tech can really, really kind of contribute. You have a lot of experience in this space. Um, just your thoughts in your opening, uh, Shijat. Thanks, brother. Am I audible? Yes, you are. Yeah. So you know, you know, firstly, you know, this is a subject of a great interest for me. You know, since last you know fifteen years, I've been tracking this subject, and you know, I know. an era wherein we didn't had much of a technology players uh, and currently if we talk about uh, there are a lot of legal technologies in pretty much all the area which you know, have and other colleagues so, so specifically i just want to share uh, you know my thoughts in two buckets you know, one as a legal professional as a lawyer uh, with respect to sustainability i think you know lawyers have a great area to contribute uh, with respect to use of the legal technology whether it is with respect to the work collaboration or with respect to the uh, you know the digital uh, usage as a lawyer i think you know whether law firms or the in house councils uh, you know contributing to the you know uh, the green uh, you know agenda i think that is a significant area which uh, legal technology in running in house legal functions and at the same time also the law firms secondly you know i think you know the current context of broader sustainability agenda the esg frameworks of the organizations which a lot of companies are significantly focusing as you can see uh, with respect to the uh, investment criteria and all uh, sustainable uh, investing is a, is a huge thing and if you see uh, when we evaluate uh, the esg framework and the implementation in the company how the legal technology is actually helping in the agenda so from esg standpoint as you all know uh, with respect to the environment there's a lot of data need are there uh, Whether it is environment, you know, the kind of emissions, the kind of uh, uh, the compliance uh, need is there. Uh, so same thing with the social aspect with respect to the people, community, vendors, uh, and so on and so forth. And of course, in the governance framework, you know, we have the whistleblower policy, the board diversity risk, and so on. And and if you map uh, how the legal tools, whether it is contract management or the third party risk assessment or the governance uh, assessment or the overall. e-learning or uh, tools which are really helping i think all of these things uh, which uh, really contribute uh, with respect to demonstrating uh, the you know the centering the esg framework and also more importantly providing the data uh, to you know assess uh, the esg uh, ratings or the you know status of the organization so that's the uh, bridge i want to uh, make clear that you know the, all the legal technologies whether it's compliance education contract all of those stuff uh, whatever we just discussed uh, how it is really helping the esg agenda of the company is an important area for us to assess i think these are my opening remarks and i will uh, share more thoughts excellent sujatha i think this is really really uh, good i think uh, what is what you make out about esg and the data requirement and how legal tech could really take advantage of it is uh, really interesting Uh, I do want to come to Smita now, and Smita, why don't you tell us your perspective? I know uh, everyone here is speaking very highly of technology. Um, why don't you give your perspective and you know uh, maybe bring a pinch of salt to the entire conversation? Uh, sure, Badri. Uh, first of all, uh, legal era. Thank you for uh, you know giving me this opportunity, and uh, it's a lovely panel. And for also thanks to all the. participants for uh, you know spending their valuable time i hope that you know uh, you all get to take away some good points from the session so having said that i'll just stray, uh, straightly uh, you know i mean go straight to the topic uh, in terms of challenges i think i will start with a very simple yet classic example of a driver driverless car right so what does a driverless car do i mean there's nobody present there it just goes on its own on its own correct so in case this driverless car uh, you know meets with an accident so you know there's obviously a litigation so once you start the litigation uh, who's to be blamed right i mean is it the car owner because the car is registered under that owner's name if that's the case being a devil's advocate i can always argue that uh, you know even though the car belonged to me uh i wasn't there so how am i to be blamed right so this is a classic scenario from this emerges certain other aspects like uh privacy for example because uh driverless cars always have the you know cameras inbuilt and if there are other co passengers seated in the car uh you know was your consent obtained uh, you know to begin with 
that's just you know one thing and then you also have the other sort of uh, you know regulatory issues like for example uh, you know if that car uh, you know is typically in the us uh, many states have their own uh, privacy and you know consumer protection laws and so on and so forth so is this car actually compliant with all these laws that are existent right i mean because laws actually vary from state to state and secondly any data you know in relation to the car be it the speed limit or you know be it the uh, surveillance mechanism you know are all these technologies actually meeting you know all the regulations this is just a very like i said simple but humble example this is food for thought that's my opening remark and coming you know i think i'll just go uh, you know straight to a couple of other challenges in the day to day scenarios that you know everybody in the legal uh, uh, world faces first thing i'd like to talk about is uh, the preparedness of the lawyers per se right i mean a uh, traditional gc like me i mean i'm when it comes to technology i'm really not technologically savvy so if you give me things like big technology i will obviously find it difficult to work to begin with right if i don't understand the technology what good is that technology to me right i mean i'm sure there are more lawyers i mean simple things uh, you know which are within our reach definitely we can you know control and understand but i don't know how far it's going to work right the second point is obviously yeah. cost uh, i guess uh, ruchika rightly mentioned about the roi aspect now i'm not even going to go to the roi aspect right i mean to begin with is your company or is the business actually willing to even invest in the kind of technology that you are trying to buy for the legal department uh, friends and colleagues i can uh, you know assure you that every business is actually mindful of what they spend on the legal department because lawyers themselves are not cheap right and beyond that if a company has to actually spend something on technology that the lawyer wants uh, that's definitely going to raise eyebrows right so is that technology even uh, you know going to be agreed to by your business you know i think you will have to have a rock solid business case if not it's going to get shot right at the beginning even before you can actually do something right the next thing is obviously the layers of you know all sorts of laws regulations and compliances that your technology has to meet um, a classic case is you know for example if you're doing an mna right i mean mna actually spans across various jurisdictions because it's not just restricted to one particular country right so is this technology for due diligence that you're going to use um, actually can can it really go down to the granular level of details to identify the risks and all sorts of information that you're actually going to look at the answer is a big no because i you know don't really know if such a tool exists which is so comprehensive yet uh, you know i mean going into the granular level of detail and the kind of due diligence that's looking for you because i think it's it's always a combination of uh you know the use of law firms and your technology end of the day that's going to work on any kind of project right and then the next big thing is all about data that i'm going to spend a couple of minutes on because i think that is where the new age businesses uh, are actually you know thriving on you know be it fintech be it the healthcare related uh, you know i mean developments or be it ip developments uh, you know for example i mean anything in the new era is all heavily uh, you know built on data right so what happens to this data when technology uh, technology actually uh, you know uses that to its uh, major advantage the end result i guess is very clear uh, it's actually you know one or the other thing uh, actually gets infringed right you know this is a classic thing which nobody can deny because uh, you know i mean like hano said for example especially uh, i think i can think of healthcare sector right i mean if you're a patient and if one particular technology of a particular hospital actually is you know capturing all that particular patient's data i mean similarly there are like hundreds and thousands of patients everywhere and that data is actually going to get sold to these technology companies so that they can have enough data to build that particular technology that they are looking to implement or you know looking to uh, discover or come up with right i mean if there's no data what is the technology company going to do right and then before that technology company is actually going to use that data 
have proper consents been obtained by those particular people? That's a big question mark, you know? I mean, so data can be actually, you know, not utilized in the right sense for various reasons, right? And also you have these security related issues, right? I mean, uh, security related issues, I, I need not touch upon because cybersecurity, technology oh. you know, related stuff, everybody knows. So that's the other aspect to it. And last but not the least, I guess, how useful is that technology to you? I think you're the only person who can actually decide. So I think, uh, uh, you I know, know, like I said a while ago, a combination of actual human beings with technology probably is the answer. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mita. I think uh, very, very great point. Uh, I do know that we are almost running out of time. We've got a few five to six minutes left because I've been pinged by this thing. But I do want to quickly go and ask two questions, some, some important points which came out of you, Smitha, talking about it. And maybe Sujat and Pooja, you can take, tell me about it. Management buy-in, how easy, how difficult is it to get legal technology uh, uh, products for legal departments? Sujat, why don't you go ahead first? Yeah, Badri, you know, uh, if you talk about the management buy-in, even Smitha did mention, I think, you know, uh, I think 10 years back, the situation was very different. I used to hear uh, from GCs and, you know, uh, with respect to the challenges, what they used to face with respect to getting the budget. But I think the increased evolution of the GRP or the ERM and ESG and sustainability agenda and so on and so forth. And I think a lot of stakeholders are seeing those benefits at, a, you know, the board level and an executive level. So I would see at this point of a time, the buy-in from management on the technology is definitely increasing. I mean, that's the conversation. I mean, uh, uh, but the earlier the focus of finance guys were fully with the investment. I think now I can see HR and legal uh, teams as well uh, are having you know a lot of budgets and proposals. And I see a much positive uh, support and with a lot of companies having these CTOs and CIOs as well. I think there is an overall sure. uh, phenomena of a digital agenda. And as part of that, I think even legal and compliance, all these you know functions are uh, able to get a uh, say with respect to asking for the right tools and agenda. So I think it's much, much better in my view. Of course, the business case has to be presented, uh, you know, which will really be helpful. Yeah. Perfect. Pooja, why don't, what are your thoughts? What um, are your experiences? No, I, I think, uh, you know, we are a bit into a different situation being an IT, ITS organization. We have, in fact, <laughs> you know, different mm. enabling functions have KRAs that you have to, uh, you know, adopt tech and leverage technology. Uh, but uh, that said, you know, it's not that you can go in and bring about any and every tool, even the internal processes, knowing at the nature of our business are very stringent uh, because you have to evaluate and it's a, uh, you know, long drawn process as well, if I may say so that, uh, you know, how you bring a bond, bring into the business, any uh, technology and uh, definitely you have to demonstrate what value it, uh, you know, generates for the legal team and for the business. As I earlier on also said that uh, just bringing in the tool, uh, you know, thinking just about your department won't help. How uh, different tools also, I think Ruchika alluded to the same, that how different tools also are speaking to each other so that they could effectively, uh, you know, uh, generate a user experience for your, uh, you know, business functions. That, I guess, is very, very important. And, of course, it should, uh, you know, help you make more efficient, help you generate, in fact, more time to invest for strategic issues that where you're required. Right. You could value add to uh, very many different processes. So uh, businesses will um, it's definitely easier to uh, secure approvals uh, today as compared to, say, five years back, but uh, backed up by uh, relevant business cases. I don't know. I think one last thing I want to go to Hanno and Ruchika uh, with, with this, you know, legal departments and lawyers in general, uh, confidentiality data, ownership, privacy, very, very important. What we deal with is very sensitive information, company information, uh, and of course, uh, privileges and all, all sorts of things. Uh, legal tech requires data. Uh, legal tech uh, requires, you know, IP being exposed, okay? What are your thoughts, uh, Hanu, to start with you? Um, what are your thoughts with respect to IP and data uh, and its overlap with uh, legal tech? Yeah, of course, I think that's one of the most fundamental uh, questions. Um, and I think that one always needs to differentiate between conservative old fashioned companies such as Siemens, although we are transforming, but still Siemens is an old company. And then, um, you know, something like Tesla or uh, also Google, Facebook, 
block and because they have a very, very different approach. I mean, their whole business models are basically based on new technology, so they cannot afford only thinking about complying with all the current regulations. They can't. If they did, then, I mean, Tesla, for example, that was a very good example. And how do you solve the liability problem? It's still not really solved, but it doesn't stop Tesla from selling cars because they are just doing it. Um, and I think that's, a, and they are, of course, um, you know, advocating for certain laws and approaches. And that's a very different approach. Um, and you need to, to, to be a little bit more open, I think, to risks um, without knowing the exact results at the end of the day. Otherwise, you are just not fast enough. Um, and otherwise, you can't, you just lose. So that's very interesting also for us. Um, as Siemens, because we also try to, to change that. We know we need to, and I think we are quite successful, but we can learn a lot from Tesla's, Facebook's, Google's, and the like, I think. So really nice, the balance between speed and protection. That's really the criteria for, yeah. for this. And Rishika, your thoughts on this? Yeah, so I think, uh, you know, I agree with what Heno said that, you know, the technology enhancement has also, you know, uh, raise the issues of privacy and uh, privacy protection. And today, you know, in India, the privacy protection law not being, you know, finally uh, there. So, you know, there, this is definitely a concern for a lot of organizations. But I think uh, just to, you know, add on to that, that, you know, I read uh, sometime back, uh, you know, there was a court matter where Kerala High Court is deciding the question whether the right to demand digital services from the government, is it a fundamental right of a citizen? So I think there, you know, where, uh, you know, if this issue is decided whether, um, you know, as a citizen, if I want certain um, data, like, you know, uh, specifically uh, with respect to, you know, Supreme Court passed in order that special marriage act was enacted and then presence of the, you know, the both the spouses can, uh, can be dispensed with and it can be done through video conferencing. So, you know, these are the issues which are coming up. But the point is that obviously till, uh, you know, a robust uh, data privacy law comes into India, these issues will remain. Understood. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think all of these are excellent points. We have run out of time, but uh, I must thank each and every one of you for some great inputs and thoughts. Uh, I think this is a panel that we can speak for the whole day and we'll still not uh, scratch the surface. Uh, but I must say that uh, it's been a pleasure hosting and, and moderating this panel and all of your excellent thoughts on this. So thank you very much uh, for being part of this and uh, over to you, Shikha. Thank you so thank much. You much. Thanks, Badri. Thank you. Thanks to all of us. And uh, amidst all the thank yous, here comes my big thank you to you, Badri, and to the entire panel for your, uh, you know, for bringing your honest take on the table for the topics. So thank you very, very much.